Hello, uh, and welcome to this webinar organized by the European Parliament's London office as part of its extremely effective outreach program in post-Brexit Britain. Uh, first, an apology. I'm a, a firestorm virgin. I've never encountered this mechanism before, but it seems to be very efficient, and so uh, you're very welcome to this webinar. My name is Edward McMillan Scott, and as some of you know, I was a pro-European member of the European Parliament from 1984 to 2014, um, and after the European elections in 2009, having been leader of 36 Tory MEPs, I objected to the split from the EPP group, engineered by David Cameron, and left the Conservatives, <coughs> and sat for a brief period as an independent and then a Lib Dem, but lost my seat in 2014. Since then, I've coordinated uh, an informal forum of academics and journalists uh, uh, and activists under the code name Where Next for Brexit. <clears throat> and this led to the People's Vote campaign for which we raised more than two million pounds and very nearly got that second referendum. I'm also an active patron of the European movement, which has pledged to rejoin the European Union when the time is right and when the British people have woken up to the realities of Brexit. But it's a particular pleasure to uh, host today's proceedings with George Parker, a political editor of the FT, and uh, David Harley, former DEPSEC Gen of the European Parliament, whose diaries uh, we are celebrating today. So this is the first lockdown launch I've ever done. Um, as you probably know, David Harley was uh, successively, and not exhaustively, a Parliament's Director of Press and Media, spokesman for Parliament's President Pat Cox, Secretary General of the Socialist Group and ended his prestigious career as DEPSEC Chair of the Parliament. Now for the next 30 minutes, David and George will discuss the themes and issues raised in the book and their relevance to the, the relevance to the current political landscape in the European Parliament and across the European Union. On a date such as today, almost exactly five years after the referendum, the B word will no doubt be mentioned once or twice, but more broadly, this session will be about the lessons from the past and pointers for the future we could draw from that time. The second part of the event will be dedicated to answering questions from you, the audience. So just some housekeeping rules for that part. Please do submit your questions via the box on the right hand side of your screen and please do upvote any questions you like by clicking the upvote button on the left of the question button. Do feel free to start putting up questions as the conversation goes. I shall moderate the questions with some assistance. If you want to ask your question in person, please let us know when posing it. And then please make sure that you're using the Google Chrome browser. And when given the option, accept the prompt to allow Chrome to use your webcam and mic when asked to join the stage. Before handing over to the panel, I have the pleasure to pass the microphone to my old friend, Joime Duc, the European Parliament's Director General for Communications and also its spokesperson for his welcome address. Hi, May, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Edward, uh, and thanks to, to David, of course, uh, for having uh, proposed uh, to me to, to briefly uh, take part in this uh, presentation. I feel uh, honored about this uh, commission because David, was, uh, David has been a reference uh, uh, for me uh, in many aspects of my uh, professional life. At a time where my, my career was uh, just uh, promising, and as you know, uh, not all promises can be kept. Um, I had the chance to, to work with him uh, for several years, starting in 1999, uh, right after I had served as a press officer uh, for, for a president of the parliament, Jose Maria Gil Robles at that time. And I use the word press officer and not spokesperson uh, because as the head of cabinet of the president told me uh, at that time, the only spokesperson of the president is the president himself. Of course, this was before uh, David joined uh, Pat Cox's uh, cabinet, not only uh, to become his spokesperson, uh, but also to wear uh, that hat besides that of a spokesperson of the parliament, uh, both key functions uh, in the hands of the, of the same man. 
Um, I'm not surprised about uh, the quality and the high interest of uh, David's uh, uh, book. Uh, in more than uh, 30 years in this house, I rarely met someone with uh, David's uh, talent, culture, uh, a good mastery of uh, several languages, and uh, ability to navigate between the institutional and the political uh, levels of the European Parliament. And um, trust me, in a parliament, uh, making uh, the difference between those two levels can be, can be difficult uh, when not impossible. Um, Labour cabinet minister Barbara Castle, who, as you probably know or remember, used to be also an MEP uh, for some time, uh, once said, I wondered once again at the unique quality of the British uh, civil service the unique capacity of its top people to develop a genuine loyalty to a minister who wasn't here yesterday and will be gone tomorrow. In the case of uh, uh, David, as of many other British European uh, civil servants, uh, it was more about the loyalty to, to an institution and through it uh, to an idea or to an ideal. Uh, you will find uh, many uh, proofs of, uh, of this uh, uh, in the pages of, uh, of his book. Before uh, Moleskin became popular, uh, David used to write down his notes in, a, in, a small, in small black uh, notebooks during all kind of meetings. I saw him uh, doing this many times and uh, always suspected that they uh, would end up in a book and I'm pleased to see that uh, I was right about it. Uh, in the beginning, he probably did it because of his functions as an advisor uh, to the president and secretary general. But at some point, he stopped being just a simple note taker uh, to become an active uh, witness first. And then one of the actors of uh, uh, many moments later on, some of them are very relevant for parliaments and, and for EU's uh, history. Uh, David kept diaries uh, during 12 years, from 1999, when uh, he was Parliament's director for, of press and media, as uh, Edward uh, said, and when, uh, when until he ended his career as a Deputy Secretary General. Uh, they work as, uh, as a record by, by one who, who was in the room uh, of uh, what went on, uh, on uh, who said what, uh, in meetings between politician, political leaders, uh, policy makers uh, uh, in Brussels and, and beyond. But also tell a lot of uh, rather unexpected stories and behind the scenes anecdotes you wouldn't uh, expect from an EP uh, official. Uh, the book is extremely rich, it's uh, full of stories, uh, many of which shed a different light on, on events which uh, people who uh, who were in the institutions uh, or witness or, or, or lived. A uh, couple of examples, the, the visit of the Queen uh, to the Parliament in 1989, if I'm not wrong, uh, wearing in full European blue, uh, and when David was asked to prepare a Dubonnet and gin drink for her. This is a good example of uh, this uh, human, somehow uh, quirky uh, narration of uh, events. Some tough moments too, as the, the infamous uh, Berlusconi role uh, when he called Martin Schulz a capo, uh, including a, a dramatic account of the work behind the scenes from the incident to the regret not apology statement, uh, with the butterfly effect of uh, Gerhard uh, Schroeder uh, having to relinquish his uh, holidays in, in Tuscany, and Martin Schulz uh, starting a new and a, and a more visible phase of uh, his political career. Even the, the officially boring uh, convention to reform the European treaties and its uh, two years of discussions uh, became a, a, a rather eventful red thread. It's not only about Europe or about Europe home policies. The several trips to the United States also allow the reader to go through vivid pictures of the complex uh, relationship between the US and, and Europe in the aftermath of 9-11 the visit to Washington in 2004, right after the terrorist attack in the Atocha station in Madrid, is, is painfully revealing uh, of the state of mind. And, and this was uh, long before uh, Trump. What is more unexpected, perhaps, is the predominance of three red uh, threads uh, throughout the, the book. And the role play by David of what uh, defined the, the geopolitical scene at that time, and, and still very much does, the situation in the Middle East and the role played by, by the Parliament, 
uh, the apparent uh, predictability of the war in Iraq, the growing narrative on uh, the weapons uh, of mass destruction, and then, of course, uh, it cannot be otherwise, uh, the relationship uh, to the European Union of the new uh, Labour government and its evolution from being extremely close to entering the Eurozone uh, to uh, drifting away uh, from its original enthusiasm. By the way, the, the particular role uh, of David back then in the socialist group and his uh, liaison with uh, the 10 Downing Street uh, gives an interesting uh, UK angle to the book and depicts uh, the golden age of this uh, uh, country uh, in the institutions with, with prominent figures uh, uh, and with a real wish uh, to have an impact. In the current uh, context, this is uh, probably one of the most striking lessons of this uh, book. Although not a book about Brexit, it's not mentioned at all. Um, on the days after uh, the five years anniversary of the referendum, it leaves uh, the reader with the distinct uh, impression that maybe, maybe it was not uh, inevitable after all. Uh, but I stop here. Uh, too many teasers uh, could kill the movie. Thank you very much. Thanks, David. Thank you, Jerry. Um, and thank you very much. Um, yeah, my name is uh, George Parker. I'm the political editor of the Financial Times here in London. Um, but before that, I was um, the Brussels Bureau Chief for the FT right. in uh, the years 2002 to 2007. Um, and that's where I got to know David very well. So it's a huge honour for me to be able to have a conversation about your times in Brussels and Strasbourg and, and the book you've written. And I have to say, David, you were always the model of calm professionalism throughout all my encounters with you um, over the years. Nobody's ever told me that before. Apart from the time when, <laughs> ah. <laughs> when, Peter, when Peter Mandelson wound you up. Tell, just tell us very briefly, but what, what did Peter Mandelson do that really wound you up? I honestly can't remember. I mean, surely Peter Mandelson and I would <laughs> never, never have had any difference of opinion on anything. Um, well, Peter, I think, arrived in, in Brussels hoping uh, that he would be the eminence grise behind President Barroso in the same way that he thought he was uh, in Downing Street with Tony Blair. And he gave the impression to Martin Schultz, to me, to the group, uh, almost from day one, that he was not really on the side of European socialists, but uh, he was trying to uh, make the running within the commission. And so when we had this famous vote uh, on, I think it was October the, the, the 20th, 20th, 2004, on the new commission, on the Barroso Commission, and every single one of the 21 delegations uh, stood up in the socialist group and said they would vote against the Barroso Commission. I saw Peter Manson scuttle out of the room and get, get the, the nearest phone, and he phoned Barroso, and he wanted to be the first person to tell Barroso that things were not looking great. And he rang me at home a few days later. He said, I have to speak to Tony this evening. David, I think you are the only person uh, that knows what's going to happen in the European Parliament about the next commission. And I kind of told him that I think there's not much <laughs> chance of it being elected. That was not the answer that he wanted to hear. But eventually, all this got sorted out. And Peter Mandelson was one of the most effective and competent uh, commissioners uh, across all nationalities and political persuasions. But I think it took him a, a few days or a few weeks to realize that there was another culture out there. It wasn't quite the same as the Whitehall political culture. Indeed. And as I was saying, I mean, your book covers a fascinating period in, in European and, and global politics. Yes. Um, and one of the things I thought reading the book was the, the sense that clouds were gathering. And, and the, the, there was a there was a storm approaching, and whether it was the referendums on the constitution that went the wrong way from the people who supported it, to your encounters with Tony Blair, um, where you could tell his enthusiasm for Europe was starting to wane, some of the reservations around enlargements, the EU's embrace of liberal financial capitalism, <laughs> British style, in the run up to the financial crash in two thousand eight, another disaster waiting to happen. And then the meetings you described of the socialist groups um, discussing the future of socialism in an era of globalization and mm. obviously not wholly convincingly coming up with an answer. So maybe we come on to some of those big themes in a minute in our okay. discussion. Yeah, yeah. But as Jeremy said, you, the book is also full of some amazing anecdotes. And you've heard <laughs> the one about your job as the drinks waiter for the Queen at the European Parliament. Just to just remind us a bit about the, 
the encounter after Silvio Berlusconi called Martin Schulz a capo in the European Parliament. I think you um, were in the lift with Pat Cox, the president of the Parliament. What, what exactly was said? Well, there was a bit of tension in the air and Berlusconi was kind of looking very serious, but at the same time, I really got the impression he, he, he didn't realize the significance of what he just said and why there was so much fuss. And so there was deadly silence. And then the, the usher pressed the button to go up the few floors to the dining room. And Pat Cox turned to Silvio Berlusconi and said, Silvio, what the fuck have you done? <laughs> and standing behind um, Berlusconi was Prodi's chef cabinet. When we arrived in the dining room, Brody chef de cabinet uh, didn't take his seat at the table immediately, but went straight down to the press room and told the Italian press what Cox had just said. <laughs> because as we know, Prodi and Berlusconi were, were, were great friends. And it was on the front page of La Repubblica the next morning, Silvio, che cazzo hai fatto? <laughs> there we go. Yeah. And one of the story which I've never heard before, um, which goes back to 1994. So Jacques Delors had just yeah. ended his term as European Commission president. Mm. And there was a big search to find a big figure to succeed him. And the name Peter Sutherland came up. And you were there at the moment when Peter Sutherland's, what could have been a, a, an incredible job for him, was scuppered. Well, his chances were scuppered, but I think he never knew that they were scuppered. <laughs> and obviously, you'll have to, you and those listening uh, to our conversation, will have to read the book to, to get every single detail. But to, to summarize the situation, I was, the, 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 the European Council had been suspended for a few hours because there was no agreement on who should be the next president of the mission. So a lot of us retired to the swimming pool in the Corfu Hilton. And I noticed that the Irish delegation was divided into two. There was the Taoiseach's party at one end of the pool and the foreign minister, Dick Spring's party, on the other end. And an emissary arrived from Papandreou, the father, who was the president of the European Council, Prime Minister of Greece at the time, saying, we have wonderful news for Ireland. Mitterrand and Cole have decided that Peter Sutherland must be the next president of the commission. Could you please uh, tell Peter uh, and just confirm that he's available? And the emissary went off and Spring turned to his friend and said, oh, who the fuck does he think we are? Yeah. Sutherland, after all he hasn't done for us, no way. Let's have another drink. And so there was no communication to, to Geneva. The emissary came back uh, and Spring had the gall say, um, please tell the prime minister that everything's fine. Um, Peter Sutherland would love to do it. Uh, and then they went into full uh, European Council and Albert Reynolds, the teacher, got up and said, we're very sorry that the Irish government cannot support this proposal. And that was the end of it. So mm. Sutherland was never informed uh, and the Irish government one day should perhaps answer for it. It makes it, of course, a little bit more understandable why Pat Cox, who also thought that he, as an Irishman, he had a chance of being president of the commission, mm. he didn't really get very much support either. So there's something about Ireland and presidencies of the commission that needs a bit more research. Now, your, your enthusiasm for the European project, the European ideal, mm. shines through in this book. And it covers you know, the years 1992 to 2010. Yeah. Looking back on it, is the European Union stronger or weaker now than it was when you started keeping your diaries? I just go back to what you said uh, a couple of minutes ago about you got the impression reading the book there were clouds gathering. Well, I think ever since the beginning of the European <laughs> Union up until today, there's been a cloud on the horizon of one sort or another and sometimes several. And the genius of, of the European Union is to, with patience and determination and sometimes selflessness, to overcome national objections and to reach a consensus which is often not perfect to make the clouds disappear until the next problem arrives and it always will in any union of 27 previously 28 countries uh, there were always going to be disagreements but i would like to put it on record personal view that the the road to brexit the long and winding road to brexit began not in brussels but in london and ended in London. Brexit is a British production, a British creation. And for 40 years, the most distinguished British diplomats, commissioners, politicians, MEPs, and officials all contributed decisively uh, to the day-to-day -day work 
of the European Union, with commitment and a full-hearted approach to the development of the European Union. So is the European Union stronger today? I would share the view that Britain's departure has made a lot of things easier. And the recently decided European Recovery Fund, for example, I can't really see a British government signing up to something like that. Mm. There are different problems, uh, but I think the current commission is on the right track. Uh, and the importance and the lead that the European Union has given, I would, I would say, on climate change and the digital economy, these are two areas where Europe uh, can show the way forward, not only to Europe, but to the rest of the world. So during the course of the book, we, the European constitution was a big thing yeah. while I was in Brussels. And sure. you, you say that Brexit was made in, in London, finished in London. But in that period, you yeah. had France and the Netherlands voting mm. against a big European yeah. project. Was that a wake-up call for people at the time? Or how, did, how was that seen? Well, you may have recalled the, uh, the remark or the, the quote from Pascal Lamy quoting Jean Monnet, mm. really from the very beginning of the European yes. Union, say the people don't like integration, so don't let's tell them, let's just get on with it. And that kind of worked for the first 10 or 20 years, and it doesn't work to the same extent. The idea that Europe should be uh, an elitist project, technocratic, bureaucratic, uh, without a proper resonance with the voters in, in, the, in the member states. So the convention was an attempt to improve that. The new conference on the future of Europe, let's hope, uh, may, may bring some solutions. But I believe that there are still very fundamental problems about the European Union's image. I've been to a number of other countries in recent years, particularly France, where I've had some very difficult conversations with Gilets Jaunes and members of, of the National Front. Uh, and so there's much more that needs to be done. But there always was and there always will be. But what, I suppose what I'm getting at is, given Monet's dictum that you don't, <laughs> that you don't tell people what you're up to, yeah. is it not possible that other countries in the past or even in the future, mm. if they were ever given the choice that they were given in the people were given in the UK, they could vote to leave the European Union? Well, uh, everything is possible, as Brexit has shown. And going back to what I was saying earlier, during those 40 years when everything seemed fine, relatively speaking, for Britain's relations uh, with the EU, uh, it was unimaginable that Britain should leave. Nobody mm. really thought it. It kind of started, there's perhaps you know, a line to be drawn from the, the change in the electoral system in, in 99, when uh, UKIP arrived for the first time with, with three MEPs. Um, so it is possible that other, other countries might uh, decide to leave. It's also possible that the European Union might invite some countries, <laughs> current members, to leave. Mm. Um, but I think that the most important thing of all is that the, the, the European Union starts thinking about the difficulties that people have in the pockets of poverty and deprivation uh, that exist around Europe. We've seen it in, in this country. There's a kind of European version of the Red Wall as well in, in ma many other countries. And those are issues and demographic questions, questions of public expenditure, questions of getting people's um, approval, consensus uh, in economic matters that has been largely neglected. But I, I would just add one other thing. That is that one should not underestimate the exceptional nature of the reasons that led Britain to leave, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Countries may have objections, many, many even founded on the way the European Union works, but I can't think of any other country among the, the 27 that, that is continually harking back to a thousand years of history, the Sceptred Isle, uh, and frankly, nationalism, which doesn't really have its place in today's global world, far less global Britain. And of course, from 1997, we had a, mm. a pro-European prime minister. Yeah. And with, through your involvement with the Socialist Group in the European Parliament, you had plenty of dealings with Tony Blair and Number 10 throughout that period. Yeah. And you describe in the book the sort of almost the draining away of enthusiasm for the European project. And can you describe how that felt? Well, to some extent, you could hardly sense it at the time. It's one of, one of the useful mm. things about reading a diary, mm. is that the, the form of the diary is the slow, gradual accumulation of information, how you'd see situations develop and personalities 
emerge and, and re-emerge and change. You can't really see if you read uh, either but my, the expression of um, sort of day-to-day -day mainstream media journalism or indeed academic treatises. The, the diary gives, should, if properly written and with the right voice, gives an accessibility that other genres uh, do not have. So it came as a bit of a shock, really, to, when you, one suddenly realized that Tony Blair was kind of taking his foot off the, the European accelerator. Uh, and it was certainly a disappointment but I think one has to link uh, his waning and uh, relative loss of uh, enthusiasm for the European project with the Iraq saga. Mm. And I think that, yes, he should have perhaps gone for it, gone for the referendum on the euro in the first term, but he would say and has said in his memoirs that there were many other things that he should have done in his first term. He was ultra cautious. Mm. One, that was one of the reasons that's why he managed to win three general elections. And then he had a spot of bother occasionally with the Chancellor, with Gordon Brown. But by the time uh, the third term had come, after Iraq, millions of people demonstrating in the streets of London against the decision to join uh, George W. Bush uh, in war with, with Iraq, the political capital was no longer there. And the end of story. And of course, we have in this country, and even more so back in the period yeah. you were writing about, a very powerful press in this country, sure. the Murdoch press. And you, yeah. you describe in your book a meeting you had with Rupert Murdoch, I think it was in Los Angeles, wasn't Correct, it? Correct, yeah. And uh, you had a brief chat about European politics, I believe. Yes, it, we kind of saw two sides of Rupert Murdoch uh, in the space of about 10 minutes. And the, the first si side that we saw of him was of a you know, slightly frail, stooping, impeccably suited gentleman uh, who recognized us before we recognized him, which was always, I mean, perhaps somebody had, you know, had a word in his ear, but you know, it was nice. He made us feel at home. He poured us out a cup of coffee uh, before this breakfast meeting. And then we sat down, we started talking, and then he launched into a sort of two pronged attack. First, on poor President Prodi, who Murdoch claimed had been was soft on terrorism. Um, and then the, the question that really got Murdoch going was his idea that the European Union wanted to in, make him pay more tax. Uh, and this was such, such a big question for him that he almost kind of lost it. And he was sort of going slightly florid in the face uh, <laughs> and quoting completely made up provisions of the constitutional treaty to bolster his argument. So I hope that somebody uh, who had given him his speaking notes uh, was reprimanded afterwards because he was speaking complete gibberish. <laughs> now, um, you also talked about enlargement, yeah. uh, which obviously was a big part of that 2004 sure. and then yeah. subsequently in 2007 with mm. Romanian Bulgarian accession. Yeah. Can you describe the mood in Brussels and Strasbourg at the time? What was their trepidation about the scale and speed of the enlargement process and to what extent do you think it might have contributed to events which culminated in Brexit? I think that uh, the first thing I would say was that there was a mood of great optimism uh, at, at the beginning anyway and personified by Pat Cox who spent an enormous amount of time traveling around the the applicant states and the reason that I don't say more about enlargement is that there were other colleagues in his uh, cabinet uh, who, who did that side of, of his work as, as president. And indeed, I'd like to mention from the list of people who have registered for our meeting today, there are at least two former socialist MEPs from the new member states uh, who are listening in and who were present during those emotional first few weeks and months after enlargement. So yes, there was optimism. For certain countries, there was concern. Uh, I relate uh, a meeting with the uh, Romanian Minister of Justice, Monica Makovai, mm. after which it seemed absolutely clear that there was no way that Romania was going to fulfill formally the, the criteria. And then there was also, I make reference to the lunch that I attended with um, Madeleine Albright and Boroslav Geremek, uh, the former Polish uh, foreign minister, when he said that the what is missing in Poland and most of the applicant states is a properly functioning civil society and that more work should have been done, he inferred, before enlargement, not just on the economic side, on the trade side, but in social and political institutions. 
And then finally, there was a speech that Vaclav Havel made shortly before his death to the plenary in the European Parliament, when he said, please be patient. This has never happened before. There's never been a case in world history where there are 10, 12, 15 countries who lived under communism for 40 or 50 years. This is a new experiment. You can't expect everything to come right overnight. But he was right on that. Do you think the EU should still be showing patience with Hungary, for example? I think the patience is wearing very thin. Um, but fortunately, they only drew last night, so that helped. <laughs> very close front thing, of course. Um, and you touched on the Iraq war. Mm. And I think you had a meeting with Richard Butler, who was yes. one of the, who was one of the uh, uh, people who was supposed to be assessing whether Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. This was a few years before the invasion, the Western invasion of, of Iraq. Yes, it was, Iraq. Yeah, yeah. What was that meeting like? Were you, did you sound like you had a compelling case? Absolutely not. And this is what I found fascinating. And it's interesting to go back and look at your diaries because obviously you don't carry all the information with you over the 20 or 30 years you wrote the diaries. Uh, and it was very much, Richard Butler was, was considered very much as a kind of American stooge. And remember, this was not under George W. Bush. This was under Clinton. Uh, and there was the, his French deputy made this statement a year or so after the meeting that we had. But he said that the decision to uh, go to war with Iraq, or at least the first bombing threats that were carried out in December of that year of 98 were based on very specious evidence. When the State Department would continually say, supported by Richard Butler, uh, that Saddam had thousands of ballistic and chemical weapons uh, that were unaccounted for, and that he was promoting, actively promoting nuclear weapons, and that he was refusing access to inspectors. And that was not true. There were 303 missions of inspectors in the year 1998, and only three were not given access. So the whole Iraq story over a period of five to 10 years was based on misleading and false information. Some of that misleading and false information also, I believe, was fed into the decision taken by the British government on that question. Just describe the, the mood, for those who don't have memories stretching back that far, of some of those European Council meetings in 2003 between Blair and, uh, and Chirac in particular. They were very difficult, um, but there was very little support uh, for Britain and even less for, for the United States. But you're right, Chirac is quoted in the, in the book as saying that uh, George W. Bush's administration is the most reactionary in American history. And Schroeder was, is also quoted as saying that he, he won his uh, general election for three reasons. The floods, the fact that his opponent was Bavarian, and the war in Iraq. Uh, and so there was no quarter given. And as Pat Cox says to Blair at one stage, his elasticity was becoming impossible to maintain. That the, the Blair idea of you know, presenting the European point of view in Washington and the Washington point of view in, in Brussels, really nobody was listening at that stage. Yeah, and in terms of EU-US relations, that, that was a nadir that period, wasn't it? It's obviously improved since then. Well, do you mean since last weekend? Or okay. <laughs> where, where you, you were a direct witness. <laughs> um, I think there's still a lot more improvement that is needed. I mean, the, the interesting thing from a geostrategic point of view, uh, I, would, I would submit, is the choice that Europe has to make today. Mm. Uh, does it stick close to the United States? Does it maintain uh, or develop uh, closer relations with China and, and Russia? And I believe that there has been this gradual deterioration of relations between the e EU and the US, possibly starting you know, with 9-11 um, and then Iraq and then the financial crisis and then Trump. So Biden has come back, but he's come back in a deeply divided country. Yeah. And we're a long way from Ronald Reagan's shining city on the hill that you know, is a beacon of freedom for people around the world. So I would like to think that perhaps the EU could take over as a beacon of freedom and democracy and the rule of law. Hmm. And now you devoted a large part of your career to the European Parliament, David. Yeah, sure. So what's your reflection on the way that the Parliament's evolved over the last 20, 25 years? Well, I think it's um, evolved 
significantly and substantially in terms of its formal powers and its competencies and uh, the influence that it has on legislation. I was very lucky in my job, uh, in my time in the parliament, to have worked twice, two different occasions in the socialist group. And therefore, the link between uh, political groups in the European Parliament and political parties and indeed governments in the member states is something the Brits have never really understood, largely because uh, from the, the conservative point of view, they, they left the European political parties and ended up with a bunch of strange uh, wing uh, central Euro Europeans. There will always be more work for Parliament to do. One shouldn't either um, denigrate or exaggerate uh, its importance, but I think it plays a vital role, uh, and I would hope that it will continue to take initiatives on the lines that I've mentioned. I'm very much into this, uh, the, the problem of territorial inequality, the fact that there are pockets of socio-economic problems and poverty in almost every country of the EU, which the EU is doing little about, and, and the, the parliament must take a lead. I think it's it done so also on climate change, on the European Green Deal. Sometimes people suggest that the European Parliament is irresponsible goes too far. Uh, heaven forbid, I, I would not share that, uh, that opinion, but it is necessary sometimes to push the, 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 the Council and indeed the Commission into positions that may be more difficult to find a consensus on among 27, but which are actually the positions that matter amongst a lot of people in Europe. Now, in a minute, I'm going to hand back to Edward and we'll just kind of have a open up to the okay. audience to put some, some of their own questions to David. Yeah. But one final question about some um, you, you played a big role in the socialist group in the European Parliament. You were involved in lots of meetings in that period, sort of in the mid-2000s, where mm. socialist parties were trying to find their bearings, I guess, and mm -hmm. try to work out what they were about in a globalised world. And it doesn't sound, seem to me like they really found the answer. And, you know, that sort of era of Blair and Schroeder almost seemed to mark the high watermark of that sort of third way yeah. socialism. How do you, what's, what are your reflections on European socialism and the status at the moment? Well, if I had the answer to the problems of European <laughs> social democracy, I might not be here talking about it with you today. Um, but I, I think that one of the reasons why things have gone badly, I mean, it's a different situation in each country, but take Germany, for example, the, the decline in support for the yeah. SPD is, is quite staggering. Uh, but I would suggest that one of the first reasons for that is because Mrs. Merkel has been uh, governing from the centre and taking a lot of mm. uh, social democratic policies uh, for, for herself. And of course, the SPD have been um, replaced to some extent uh, as the main opposition party on the centre left by the Greens. And I think perhaps we may see something similar in France emerging. And we saw in the regional elections in in some regions in, in France, this alliance between ecologist Greens and very pro-European parties. So that could be the future, but I wouldn't place a large bet on uh, social democratic uh, governments having the majority in the council over the next year or two. Very good. Now, I'm going to hand over to Edward, but I'm gonna, you won't, I'll just slightly embarrass you probably. Oh, okay. I'm going to close by reading the, an extract from David's farewell speech to the European Parliament in 2010. Oh. <laughs> which actually is the very end of your book. But I think it's appropriate because it sums up what yeah, I think you're all kind. about. So okay. you say, whatever the future holds, I can say with pride that the European ideal, comprising such simple principles as friendly and enlightened cooperation between people and countries, mutual respect and understanding, cultural diversity, pooling resources to raise living standards, reducing inequalities and fighting discrimination, building on shared peace and prosperity, that ideal has been and will remain the guiding force the lodestar of my life. And I think that's a beautiful way to end our conversation. Thank so you, George. Thank you very much indeed. Very good to see you again. Back thank to you, you, Edward. Thank you very much indeed, George. And uh, thanks for your excellent uh, <coughs> interview technique, which we are so familiar with from your uh, broadcasting <laughs> activities. Um, we now <laughs> turn to questions. And uh, the one of the remarkable features of live storm, not firestorm, is that upvoting uh, promotes the most commonly liked question and it comes from Graham Watson. Uh, I don't know Graham whether you're in person somewhere or, or I should just read it out because uh, it got the most support. Perhaps I'll just read it. Um, you say, David, I look forward to reading you. Was there ever in your view a serious chance that the UK might have adopted the Euro in 1997-98? 
David, over to you. Yep. Goodbye, George. Thank you for everything. See you again. Uh, Graham, thank you very much for your question. I would say yes. Um, certainly from the pronouncements, uh, many of which are recorded uh, in the book of uh, Tony Blair, uh, and from those who represented him, not least uh, Lord Little, uh, there was every chance, and it was definitely um, British government policy uh, as an aspiration, at least. And um, the, uh, Blair went so far as to say that we cannot lead in Europe if we, are not, if we don't join the euro. We cannot lead on enlargement if we don't join the euro. So but one opportunity there. But I, I would just quickly sort of separate out from this uh, hope and aspiration that existed at that time uh, with a kind of um deduction that people make that okay so if britain had joined the euro we would never have had brexit um but i would say that you know we didn't we didn't need to have brexit even if britain was not a member of, of the euro i don't think that was a decisive factor but i think it, it could well have happened uh but there was a lack of support within the within the party within the cabinet but blair himself was very keen for this to happen i, I would think Right, and the next question comes from Alison Sutty, who worked with um, David in the Pat Cox cabinet, and she went on to work with Nick Clegg when he was Deputy Prime Minister. And if I could just remind you, David, the definition made by Nick Clegg of the new European Conservatives and Reformist group in the European Parliament <laughs> on one of the leaders' debates, he, he defined it as an alliance with a bunch of nutters, anti-Semites, and climate change deniers from Eastern Europe. Uh, that's a pretty fair description, I think. Anyway, Alison asks, very much <laughs> looking forward to buying and reading your book. Many happy and positive memories of our time in Pat Cox's cabinet, but can you share your favorite or most amusing memory other than Brexit? Are there any particular regrets that you share from your time in the European Parliament? Over to you, David. Uh, my, my most amusing memory uh, is that particular evening uh, when people went uh, swimming in a lake in Ireland. But I think Alison wouldn't wish me to say any more about that at the moment. Um, but so we had, uh, you know, a bonding session by the light of the moon, um, which was very productive in, in terms of um, developing our president's communication strategy. Any regrets? Well, I think anybody who's worked for the European Parliament, this is a bit of a mass generalization, must regret the fact that um, we clearly didn't do enough to get the message out uh, and uh, try and explain to people uh, the real advantages of, of British membership. Uh, of course, it's asking a lot and it's an impossible uh, sort of retrospective task uh, to go back in time and, and change the result uh, that emerged in the small hours of the... 23rd or 24th of June 2016. Uh, but I, we all knew that there, were, there was a strong anti-EU element in the country, but I don't think anybody really thought uh, that there was a majority. And George Parker, who, who's now had to, had to move on, uh, made a brilliant uh, video six months after the referendum when he interviews, amongst others, uh, Roland Rudd, one of the, one of the leaders of the uh, of the Remain campaign, and Roland Rudd said he he was getting through all his private polls until ten o'clock that evening. There was a victory for Remain, so there was so many different factors that uh, contributed to that result, going back almost literally hundreds of years in some cases. But I I, I regret Brexit uh, naturally, but I also regret that uh, in the different jobs that that I. Uh, held that I, I didn't do more to communicate uh, the EU's uh, positive message. Thank you. Um, David, we've got a message from Enrique Baron, who um, is unable to join us as he's in another webinar. But he says, I want to congratulate David for his smooth and calm style and his loyalty in the time he worked for me. I'm sure that his diaries will be interesting and challenging. Enhorabuena, David. Actually, what he says, 
<laughs> he wants to congratulate you for your smooth and clam style. And I just wonder whether that's the, the re reference to your discretion. Um, anyway. I accept uh, both. Sorry. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Enrique. The next uh, question. Muchas gracias, Enrique. Sí. Bueno. Me alegro. Me alegro. Um, Richard Corbett, uh, are you in person, Richard, or can I read your question out? I think I will read it out to save time. Uh, Richard, who, as we now know, uh, is, has a very long career in the European Parliament, has so now been appointed as one of the cadre of uh, experts supporting the um, the uh, conference on the future of Europe um, and working from within the European Parliament itself. Richard says, one group of people entirely focused on poisoning UK opinion by denigrating the EU at every opportunity with the UKIP MEPs. They used their parliamentary assistance and office allowances, not for their EP work, but for illegally campaigning back home. Did the EP admin do anything to try to stop this, David? Well, I think that the um, activities uh, and possibly illegal activities that Richard refers to mainly occurred uh, after I left the, the service of the European Parliament. Uh, and uh, it's dif difficult for me to comment. That's not to, to wriggle, wriggle out of the question, but I, I'm fairly certain that there have been a number of cases, including uh, cases affecting uh, specifically Nigel Farage, uh, where the European Parliament has demanded the, the, the reimbursement of, uh, of funds improperly uh, utilized. Uh, yeah. I think there was also the case involving Daniel Hannan, now Lord Hannan, yeah. one of the cadre of uh, extreme right wingers who have been ennobled by Boris Johnson, uh, involving the uh, misuse of funds through the um, one of the political foundations set up in association with the ECR. Mm. Um, there have also been cases in other countries, particularly France, concerning Miss, Mrs. Le Pen. Yes. Yeah. Um, I've now got a question from Rory Palmer. Uh, right which apparently has been upvoted. Look forward to reading the diaries, David, and thank you for the opening remarks. If you could introduce and implement one single reform, either institutional or otherwise, to improve the workings of the European Parliament and how it relates to citizens, what would it be and why? And I think if I may, before you reply, as the chairman of the single seat campaign after your diaries end from 2011 to 2014, which had the support of 76%, a supermajority of MEPs at every single vote, but obviously died with Brexit. Anyway, over to you, David. Um, I think that um, the, fir the first thing that one should, one should do is to um, draw up a program for citizens' assemblies. Now, this may fit into the Conference on the Future of Europe, and I feel there's something that we never really did enough of, um, which has been uh, practiced with great success uh, in Ireland, particularly after the various negative referendums, and also in Denmark, uh, the, um, the notion of deliberative uh, polling, I think, was used quite a lot. In other words, we have to involve people, citizens, as one says in the, in the jargon, with sort of day-to-day, down-to-earth, practical issues, and ask how they would like to see the European Union organize itself and come forward with proposals to assist them. The second thing is, I return to my issue of territorial inequality, that people are not so much necessarily, according to recent research at, at the LSE, people are not so much concerned about wage inequality, that's obviously a problem, but it's the sense that they have been neglected and left at the side of, at the, side of the road. And so we need to address that, that question uh, and not by giving handouts from Brussels via national capitals, but after consultation at more local level with the best way of using money in the social fund and the regional fund. Thank you, David. Now uh, from Joel Fiss, uh, can't wait to read David. And, and the question is, with the rise, there's a very serious one which I, I've heartily endorsed, with the rise of authoritarianism around the world, how can the EU win over hearts and minds? Question mark. Could you repeat, how can the EU what? How can the EU win over hearts and minds against the, the rise of authoritarianism? 
don't want to sound really mouthed, but it's, it's a very difficult question. But as you say, it's absolutely vital. I mean, George Parker earlier asked, uh, asked me a question about Hungary, which I didn't really answer. But I will now sort of incorporate another answer that I could have given to George in answering uh, Joel. I think it's easy to say from the outside, but I think that the European Union has to become much tougher with countries that do not respect the rule of law. And I, and I would say as well, taking the advice of the former Polish foreign minister, Mr. Sikorski, that we should separate out Poland and Hungary. But I really can't see the case for maintaining Hungary, having the full status of a member of the European Union, if almost on a daily basis, uh, it betrays the principles on which the union has been built. In other words, take a tough line with the recalcitrants. And that's one thing, that's for its own in internal reaction. Externally, uh, I think it's a good thing uh, that Mr. Macron and Mrs. Merkel uh, are proposing to have a, a summit with uh, Mr. Putin following President Biden's summit. We have to talk, negotiate. Um, but uh, to the other areas in the world, it would be a good thing if the European Union were to develop a policy specifically on this issue. It's not a side issue. It's becoming one of the two or three main issues facing the future of liberal democracy. So we have to tailor make for each autocratic and authoritarian regime, a policy and a strategy for the European Union, including obviously the use of economic sanctions. Thank you. Um, you spoke with some emotion about the enlargement of the European Union uh, in 2004. And uh, one of the people who were new arrivals at that time is, is, is the next question from Marek Siviec. Yeah. Um, he says, say something about the newcomer Poland in 2004. I think he would like you to say something about what's going on now. I think it's much more relevant, I'm afraid. Just to add to well, your you. remarks. Thank you, Marek, for your, for your question and for your service to the parliament as well as, as, as vice president. Uh, it was a different time then. It was uh, a bygone age almost for, for Poland. And the, the, the Polish delegation in the socialist group was enormously respected and contained people with fantastic uh, life stories and life histories. Uh, and we can only wait, hope and use all possible political means uh, to end uh, the current uh, regime in Poland, speaking from a socialist and social democratic point of view. Um, as ever, the difficulties facing, I would say, it's rather presumptuous of me to speak on behalf of the European Council, but anyway, uh, the, the difficulty is that we must take on the governments of these countries that do not respect the values of the European Union and the rule of law, but we must protect and defend the people of those countries uh, whose interests are being um, ignored and neglected. Thank you. And another question uh, along the same sort of lines from Edith Herzog. Uh, David, we see the new countries rem remember your leadership in the S&D group to help our early integration into the group. It was true for the UK too, removing the barriers. How do you see the role of enlargement in the UK departure? So the UK certainly was one of those areas that the, the UK, I think, play a, a useful role and uh, provided some leadership through Tony Blair and uh, the priority that he attached and the British government at the time attached to enlargement. Uh, the situation has obvi obviously has become much more complicated generally irrespective of, of Britain's withdrawal. Uh, but even though, like Edward, I regret infinitely uh, Britain's withdrawal from the European Union. Um, we are where we are, and the United Kingdom still exists. Uh, and one should not necessarily uh, rule out the possibility of the British government, even under the current uh, Prime Minister, uh, and the Foreign Office in particular, um, devising policies that can assist 
countries and individual organizations and businesses in Central and Eastern Europe. But the UK has left and whatever some people's hopes may be, rejoining is not on the cards for a long time. I believe that before we can seriously consider rejoining, the UK has to work out what sort of country it wants to be and uh, overcome its current divisions. And to bring a divided Britain back into the EU would not be doing the European Union itself any great service. Uh, Adrian Congdon um, poses a question which has some relevance to your last remark. He says, um, David, the book's a great read, and I agree with that. It's an extremely good and penetrating analysis of what really happened between 1992 and 2010. David, the book's a great read. How would you characterize the EU's response to the UK post-Brexit? Uh, well, I have to try and use polite language, but uh, I, can't, I can't really say anything uh, particularly um, positive. Um, on, a, on an official level, and I, I speak here, as you probably know, from uh, the, uh, the delegation of uh, the European Union in the, in the United Kingdom, in Smith Square, Westminster. Uh, which houses not only the European Parliament's liaison office, but the office of the European Union's External Action Service and the ambassador. Um, but His Excellency, Mr. Valle de Almeida, has his office in this building. And we hear nothing but uh, protestations from Ambassador Valle de Almeida uh, and uh, the official institutions of the European Union uh, about how we have to renew dialogue, uh, we will find a way, uh, we must give the necessary time. And I, so, on the surface, formally, officially, the diplomacy is working. And there was a great triumph uh, yesterday night in Brussels when the European Union agreed to grant uh, the UK a three-month grace period to import sausages to Northern Ireland. Uh, so that's kind of where, where we are now. That's, uh, and the, um, this is a cheap, a cheap shot, but uh, forgive me anyway. I think the wearing of Union Jack socks by Lord Frost at the G7 summit rather summed up you know, the way the rest of the world sees our country at the moment. Indeed. <laughs> what a man. Um, uh, as I think Andrew... You're Dennis, speechless, Edward. <laughs> Andrew Dennis said when, when uh, Frost made his maiden speech in the Lords, uh, uh, yeah, you have a great deal to answer for. Um, uh, yeah. So the last question will be from Patricia Ryan, but it isn't actually a question. Ah, yeah. it, it, it represents what I think many people feel about you, David. She says, wonderful to see and hear you again. One of the most brilliant and witty communicators I've had the pleasure to know. He should have his own show. <laughs> All right, Patricia, you can be my agent. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anyway, so uh, probably you can't see this, but it's matters of record, and uh, it's a really extremely good book, and I commend it all to you, um, to you all. Thank you all for joining. Thank you to the staff who put this together. Thank you to the European Parliament Office for hosting it and doing so many good things in the United Kingdom. And thank you above all to David uh, for his contributions over time to the work of the European Parliament in particular, but also the wider European Union which uh, we miss so much. And uh, I'm a little more hopeful than you are about rejoining, but it will be a long time. But we in the European Movement are absolutely pledged that that will be our future, as in the mainstream. So thank you all very much indeed, and goodbye.